All right, here I'm gonna go over some of the details regarding gene architecture. What's gene, what's it comprised of, how is it organized, what are components to a gene uh, to help cells function. So let's get into it here. So first off, the obvious question is just, you know, what is a gene? How do we define a gene? Well, a gene is kind of the work of some scientists uh, that basically determine that genes reside in chromosomes. So chromosomes contain proteins known as histones and DNA. So within the chromosome here, the little X, you have that condensed form of DNA. So here's again, here's our DNA, and these little green circles are histones. Uh, so the question was, what is the hereditary material? Is it the protein or is it the DNA here? So when we're looking specifically at those histones, that protein structure that helps organize uh, the DNA, those histones are actually very important. So while we have our chromosome, we have our chromatid, we have our DNA, and then we have those histones. Well, think of this, if we have this very long piece of string, it's very easy for it to get tangled. Therefore, histones are little protein structures that allow that DNA to kind of like wrap around uh, to help keep it organized. We see it kind of wrapping around here, and it's kind of called like balls on a chain, kind of all kind of a way to nicely condense the DNA instead of just taking a large piece of string and just kind of cramming it all together to kind of a rat's nest there. Uh, this is a very organized way to be able to uh, keep that DNA together, organized and condensed for the process of cell division. Histones actually have other uh, purposes here, but here we're just looking at the fact that they organize DNA. Now within those histones, this just gives you another kind of image or picture of how it looks. Here's our chromosome, here's our, within our nucleus, here's our DNA, and then here's our um, histones, these little uh, blue spheres here. Now when it says silent and active, the silent is kind of like taking all those spheres and kind of condensing them and keeping them tightly packed. Very hard for other mechanisms to get in there and kind of express those genes. Here the active form, we see it more spaced out, greater space. That's allowing for these genes to be active or turned on. Uh, so these histones help that organization of that DNA into potentially an active or a silent or inactive form. Now we're looking at the architecture of a gene in general. You know, how do they kind of look? Well, we have that DNA, which is very important, and we're speaking here in eukaryotes. Genes are basically fragmented, and they're composed of two components, exons and introns. And I don't know why they named them this way, but the exons are sequences that code for amino acids, and the introns don't have any coding regions. So if we look at our DNA here, and then we're going to RNA and our mRNA, ultimately we want to take that full length DNA composed of exons and introns. Now only the exons are kept, and we see that in our final messenger RNA here. So exons, a lot of people think, oh, they exit. No, exons are kept together. They are the coding regions. It is the introns that don't. The introns are spliced out. Uh, so we could see here's our total DNA sequence, here's our RNA, and our messenger RNA will only be composed of those exons. Part of the reason is this, if there's a mutation or a nucleotide base that's an error, hopefully it falls in one of the intron areas, it's spliced out and doesn't have to worry. This way the cell doesn't have to make necessarily every single nucleotide pairing and matchup uh, be absolutely critical, otherwise one little flip would cause a major mutation. Here there are some basically non-coding regions. As architecture of the gene, again speaking for eukaryotic cells, they transcribe the entire gene, uh, producing a primary RNA transcript. This transcript is then heavily processed to produce mature messenger RNA transcript. The mRNA leaves a nucleus for the cytoplasm. So what does this mean? Our primary RNA transcript has the exons and the introns. There's then an RNA processing that occurs, and that will basically splice out those introns, and only the exons will be left into that final messenger RNA, which will then be sent out to the cell. And there's a five prime cap and a poly A tail also added uh, after it's spliced as well. So if we're looking here, uh, we want to notice the locations of everything. So we have up here, the gene contains both exons and introns, that's the full DNA. Now the RNA is processed to remove the introns. That final process located over here is the messenger 
RNA. That messenger RNA will only contain the exons, and this mature messenger RNA, M stands for messenger, so mature messenger RNA, mature mRNA, travels to the cytoplasm where it's responsible for the synthesizing of important proteins for the body. Now what does this look like? Well, alternating splicing, here we have this kind of combination, produces three different proteins at the same section of DNA. Notice the alteration of the order of the exons. So the exons are the coding regions. Well, in this case, we have five exons. Here we have the RNA with the five exons and also the introns, single-stranded versus double-stranded. We have alternate splicing. What does this mean? Well, of these five exons, in this first protein, protein A, we have them in exon order one, two, three, four, five. Makes sense is how it's presented. However, alternate splicing was if we take those same exons and we mix the order up. In this case, we have uh, only exons 1, 2, 4, and 5. We're missing number 3. That's going to create a different protein. Here we have 1, 2, 3, and 5. We took number 4 out and you can see a different protein. This is the way that um, cells or DNA can conserve uh, the amount of new DNA sequences. Just simply mixing the order up will change the proteins and vastly change the function. Now processing eukaryotic mRNA through RNA splicing, what does this occur? Well, different combinations of exons can generate different polypeptides via alternate splicing. We just saw that in a previous slide there, where we have our pre-messenger RNA, and through different splicing uh, and the different combinations of those exons, different order of those exons will create different end products, in this case polypeptides, known as proteins. Now, the promoter region in a DNA sequence, it's the region of DNA that initiates the transcription of a gene. The promoter is kind of like the on or off switch to a light. It's located towards a five prime end, and it will initiate or allow that kind of coding region to then be basically expressed or trans um, into our RNA sequence here. Now, the architecture of a gene, so kind of the title here, well, it's a segment of DNA located on the chromosome that contains instructions for protein production. So this is just looking at chromosome from parent 1 and parent 2. Well, there'll be a certain locus, a certain region for height, for example. Uh, in this case, we're looking at peas, looking at Gregor Mendel. Here we're looking at pea pods, whether it'll be wrinkled or smooth in that locus. It'll be the locus or the section of gene for the um, architecture uh, within the general pea pod, whether it be a smooth pea pod or a wrinkled pea pod. And again, this, if we look at the big um, chromosome here, we look at that in a more detailed level, we'll see those histones ultimately to that DNA level of introns and exons composing of the gene. Now lastly here, just controlling the gene, getting whether it gets turned on or it gets turned off. Well, genes are typically controlled at the level of transcription, so, so the cell is not going to waste energy. In prokaryotes, proteins are either uh, blocked to allow RNA polymerase to access the promoter, or they're repressed. So repressors will block the promoter region, that kind of on and off switch. It's like someone puts a, a cover over the on or off switch and won't be able to turn that light on. Activators make the proto more accessible. Maybe it's kind of like a night light over the light switch to make it easier to find in the dark. Most genes are turned off except when needed. The cells have a lot of genes, and the whole point is not to have them all on at the same time. So we can see here just some examples uh, looking in our prokaryotes if, where they have different food sources. So low glucose and lactose is available. Well, in this case, we're having the activator go right through and make these genes. In the case here where high glucose and lactose is unavailable, we're going to repress those particular genes. And we see the same thing here where lactose is unavailable. Uh, where lactose is available, we're having some level of expression. This is looking at the lock operon in prokaryotes. So it's looking at activating these uh, lac genes. If lactose is not available, there's no point in running that or having the cell go through the process of expressing those genes. Therefore, that promoter region will be repressed and those genes will be essentially turned off. So hopefully this gives you a nice little background here of gene architecture to give you a little insight into the complexities going on within cells.